This lecture is a lecture done on treatment, which focuses on how to address abnormal disorders. And it was given, this lecture is given on Tuesday, March 30th. When somebody has a psychological disorder, they first start with the different types of therapy that are available to them. To treat psychological disorders, we have two primary types of therapy. The first is psychotherapy, and the second is biomedical therapy. Psychotherapy is techniques that are designed to affect a person's thought process. So hence the name psychotherapy. Biomedical therapy looks at the inner workings, the biological workings of what's causing the disorder, the disorder and looks to treat them. So for this one, we're talking about more like medication and also some uh, other uh, medical techniques. <laughs> There's two primary goals with psychotherapy. The first is that treatment makes it, is that treatment is effective. Uh, obviously, we all anyone who goes to therapy is looking to have effectiveness in treatment. But the big thing about therapy is that, and abnormal psychology in itself is that you can have a psychological disorder and it can go away on your own, but it takes a long time. Whereas treatment options make things go uh, faster um, and more efficiently. Uh, this is also really cost effective. So I, Obviously, therapy is quite expensive in many cases, though sometimes it's covered by insurance. But the amount of money that is lost by missing work and uh, having, you know, potential like hospital visits due to psychological disorders makes psychotherapy a much more cost effective option, uh, even though it's more money up front. Well, many psychotherapists are trained in certain techniques. Uh, many of them use what's called the eclectic approach, which is psychotherapeutic techniques from many different t sorts of, uh, of schools of therapy um, in order to best treat the individual and their needs. So let's look at the different types of therapy. <clears throat> Psychoanalysis uses insight therapies. And insight therapies are therapies that aim to improve psychological functioning um, by increasing awareness of underlying motives and defenses. And usually what they're talking about here is unconscious motives and unconscious defenses. So psychoanalysis looks to examine the role that our unconscious plays in, uh, in our day-to-day -day behavior. Um, and to do this, to understand the role that the unconscious plays insight therapies are used. And here's what they do. Free association is the one of the first things that they do. And this is where you get the typical lie down on a couch and talk to a therapist type of thing. And they basically allow you to speak about whatever it is on your mind. This could be anything. Now, the whole point of doing this is to uh, understand uh, how, like the things that you find to be important and the things that you prioritize. Um, but certainly they'll begin to ask questions that will push you in maybe some to some things that you maybe you don't want to talk about. And they call this resistance. So resistance are those things that while you're doing free association, resistance are those things that you don't want to speak about, that you are hesitant to speak about. What the therapist will do then is interpret that resistance. Why are you why are you resistant to talking about that one thing? What does this say about your relationships? And certainly over time, your different relationship ideas will begin to emerge. And sometimes those relationship, the ways that you carry your relationships will even reflect in your relationship with your therapist. And sometimes your emotional state in relationships may end up uh, being directed towards the therapist. And then we call this transference. And this is actually an important part of it. Um, with transference, this allows you to uh, be open and honest with your therapist when sometimes you can't be open and honest with the other people in your life because you're transferring those same attitudes and those same feelings um, towards how you feel about your therapist. 
And so sometimes it can be even a little bit combative, but that's important because that allows you to actually reveal that relationship. From there, the resistance interpretation is then best how to address it and how to understand those underlying unconscious motives that cause you to have certain feelings in relationships that you then transfer to the therapist. We know that psychodynamic psychology is very similar to psychoanalysis. And for psychodynamic therapy, we basically, we don't talk much about the unconscious. Instead, it's more about childhood relationships. Um, and so uh, interpersonal therapy is a type of psychodynamic therapy um, in which uh, instead of focusing on the unconscious, um, they'll focus on important relationships, especially childhood experiences. Uh, um, and even uh, the therapist-client relationship. So even uh, the way that they address one another, too, is discussed in how they carry their relationship status. Humanistic therapy is one of the more popular therapies today. And humanistic therapy is more where you are on a similar level with your therapist. And <clears throat> there's three goals to humanistic therapy. One is that self-fulfillment is boosted. And this is because the individual grows as a person. Um, humanistic therapy also has their clients, in this case, take immediate responsibility uh, for, their, uh, for their actions, their behaviors, and their thoughts. But rather than focus on the past, uh, humanistic therapy has us focus on conscious thoughts, uh, the present and the future. Rather than focus on the past and how those relationships have affected us, humanistic therapy focuses on what's going on right now. Um, and then how can you take responsibility for potentially your mistakes or things that are causing you to have psychological harm? Humanistic therapy uses a technique called client-centered therapy. Client-centered therapy basically means that uh, the focus is on the individual and is meant to make sure that the individual is really heard. Oftentimes, the individual is called a client rather than a patient. This way, it's not like there's a doctor-patient relationship, which suggests that the doctor is an authority figure. This way, by saying client, it shows that the therapist and the individual are on equal levels. The technique that's primarily used in client-centered therapy is active listening. Active listening has three main smaller kind of sub techniques. Basically, the therapist will listen to what you're saying and then may paraphrase, which means that they're going to repeat it, but kind of summarize it. This demonstrates that they really understand the things that you're saying. They're also going to invite clarification. They're also going to say, well, you know, is what is it really about? Um, this allows you to uh, discuss exactly what uh, discuss exactly what you feel about it um, and sometimes allows you to uh, encourage the patient, the client to say more. Um, and then finally, we have uh, feeling reflection. And feeling reflection is basically showing, you know, so what I'm hearing is that, you know, you are saying that this isn't good or you are, what I'm hearing is that you are saying that you know, this, uh, you know, this is certainly about, you know, is this really about your relationships or is it really about the issues that you are having? Um, and so certainly uh, this really causes an individual um, to help the client see themselves more clearly. Obviously, because it's humanistic psychology, unconditional positive regard is really important in humanistic therapy. Uh, due to the caring and non-judgmental attitude which is required for that. And ultimately, the goal with humanistic therapy is independence, that, they, that the clients stop going to therapy because they can take care of things themselves. Now we look at cognitive behavior and group therapies. Behavior therapy looks at altering an individual's self-destructive behavior, or behavior that may cause them psychological harm. Obviously, there's some ethical issues with behavioral therapy. Um, the idea that 
you are literally changing a person's behavior against their will through these different sort of therapeutic conditioning techniques uh, suggest that they are then losing a little bit of their freedom of choice or their free will. Um, but ultimately, the reason why people seek these out is because uh, the end result is going to be a lot more positive. For disorders like phobias or extreme fears, one technique, one behavioral therapy is called counter conditioning. Counter conditioning looks to reverse the conditioning that created the fear in the first place. And to do this, one thing that they might do is something called exposure therapy. Exposure therapy basically says that they're going to expose an individual to their fears. This allows them to conquer their fears. However, just exposing them to the most craziest and biggest thing that they're fearful of may create problems. So sometimes they'll use a technique called systematic desensitization which basically says that they're going to expose an individual to a very small amount of that thing that causes fear. Like, let's say, for example, you have someone who's afraid of dogs and looking at this picture. What they might do is just expose them to the really, really tiny little puppy, which is obviously not so harmful, allowing them to feel comfortable around that tiny puppy. Uh, so that way, um, then, you know, maybe a week or two later, maybe a month later, they expose them to a little dog and then to a medium dog and then eventually to a bigger dog ultimately reversing that conditioning that created the fear in the first place. Another conditioning technique that's used fairly commonly is something called aversive conditioning. Aversive conditioning causes, a, causes us to create a classical association uh, type link um, between a behavior uh, and a stimuli. Um, so this is often done for people who are trying to get over addictions or uh, alcoholism or a smoking addiction, um, what they might do uh, is, um, like for example, an alcohol addiction, uh, what they might do is they might uh, have an individual uh, take uh, a small amount of liquid every time that they have uh, an alcoholic drink. This small amount of li liquid um, makes them feel really nauseous and really, uh, you know, their stomach's upset more than normal alcohol um, um, and is not harmful beyond that. But what it does is that every time that person takes a drink and then they experience that nauseous feeling, they begin to create an association between the nauseous feeling and the behavior of taking a drink, ultimately causing them to eventually stop or limit what that destructive behavior. The one issue with aversive conditioning, though, is that aversive conditioning definitely needs to be bought in by the individual. Um, if they uh, go and say, have a drink at a bar and don't put the, the, the chemical in that liquid that creates the association, then certainly it's going to create more, uh, opportunities for extinction in that conditioning. And then finally we have operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is used a lot when, uh, treating, um, people with autism. Um, and certainly you even see this in schools, especially at lower grades. And we use something called a token economy. And a token economy basically says that for every correct behavior that an individual is going to get some sort of token. These tokens themselves are worthless, but they can be traded in for prizes or rewards or things to reinforce the good behavior. So, uh, you know, you may have had this in elementary school where you got a bunch of stickers every time you did something good and then you could turn in those stickers at a store and get some sort of prize. <clears throat> cognitive therapy looks to change and stop irrational thinking that is causing uh, psychological disorders, especially something like anxiety, but also those things like depression. There are three types of cognitive therapy that we're going to discuss here. One is called rational emotive behavior therapy. Rational emotive behavior therapy looks to change and stop irrational thinking. Now, there's three ways that they do this. One is through a process called thought stopping. And thought stopping is real simple. It's basically uh, the therapist using, um, you know, kind of aggressive techniques and kind of a tough love where you're just like, you need to stop thinking about this now. Um, you need to really uh, stop yourself from focusing on this one little thing and instead focus on the big picture. Another thing that they might do is something called reframing. Uh, and reframing 
uh, what that does is it basically looks to change why we have or change the whole uh, situation of um, what is causing the irrational thoughts. So rather than showing that, okay, I'm having an irrational thought and this irrational thought is all about, um, you know, the uh, absurdity, um, then with reframing, um, you know, it's more like, uh, let's say someone's got uh, a significant other that's rejected them. Um, she also, that person also tends to believe that uh, they are terrible, that they, you know, like it will not be accepted by anybody else and that she's worthless. Uh, and so certainly if you're looking at that situation where someone might ex be experiencing it, uh, then reframing would cause them to say like, no, okay, maybe this relationship didn't work out, but let's look at it from a different perspective. Let's look at it as this, does this mean all these other things as well? <clears throat> and certainly, uh, finally, the last thing that might be done is disputing and disputing uses logic and uses kind of in-your-face logic of, no, this is exactly what's going on, not these irrational thoughts that you think are going on. Um, and so you can see kind of the process for disputing down here, where you have an activating event, then you have beliefs about it, which of course create emotional consequences like depression. Uh, and then uh, by disputing it and using logic to challenge those beliefs, uh, then you can uh, effectively have new beliefs replace the old irrational ones. Aaron Beck, famed uh, psychologist that treated depression, uh, famed cognitive psychologist that treated depression, had his own uh, different ideas about what might work uh, for, uh, for therapy. Um, and with Aaron Beck, what he said is he wanted to just change the thought processes, but maybe not do it with such aggressive manners as REBT. So with Beck, uh, what he's doing is he might, he has three things that he wants to do with a person's beliefs. First is to reveal their beliefs, um, which is to understand and question interpretations. Then to test the beliefs by looking at uh, the consequences, the possible consequences. And, and when you know those consequences are uh, catastrophes, uh, then maybe really challenge, like, is that really what's going to happen? Um, and then uh, ultimately change the beliefs by having the individual take responsibility and resist the extremes. Finally, we look at cognitive behavior therapy. And cognitive behavior therapy is really just uh, a combination of both cognitive and behavioral therapy, um, which is an integrative therapy, which basically combines uh, changing self-defeating thinking with uh, a, some sort of conditioning uh, where this way the uh, the thoughts and the behaviors become linked and the change in thoughts create then the change in behaviors. Sometimes group therapies are used and group therapies uh, are can be helpful because it allows people to see that others share their problems. Um, and sometimes it, it saves time for the therapist and also provides feedback as uh, people try out new ways of behaving and new ways of thinking. Family therapy is another uh, type of group therapy. And with family therapy, uh, this treats people kind of in their family uh, because many, uh, many psychological issues stem from familial relationships. Um, this allows a therapist to treat individuals one at a time and then the family as a whole to work on the relationships between them. And then finally, you have self-help groups. And self-help groups are things like Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous. And what these do is that they actually don't have a therapist. They're essentially group therapy without the therapy. And they have their members, their you know more senior members, serve as kind of the role of therapist. But it allows an individual to really uh, have someone who can empathize with them because they themselves have also gone through the same struggle. Finally, we look at biological approaches to treatment. And with biological approaches to treatment, we, we look at medication. And with this one, we're looking at psychopharmacology, which is basically uh, pharmaceutical drugs that are designed to treat, uh, to, designed to treat psychological disorders. Antipsychotic drugs are designed to change 
uh, and dampen uh, irrelevant stimulation and things like schizophrenia because schizophrenia is a psychotic, uh, a psychotic drug uh, disorder. And so antipsychotic drugs themselves um, work as antagonists by essentially blocking the excess dopamine receptors that an individual with schizophrenia or other psychotic disorders might have. Um, this then be, with the lessened dopamine stimulation will dampen the stimuli that might be uh, affecting an individual um, and really limit a person's uh, hallucinations and delusions that are accompanying with the uh, psychotic disorders. However, one thing that it doesn't treat um, is it doesn't treat the negative symptoms like the social withdrawal or the lack of emotion and the lack of pleasure. One side effect of, anti of antipsychotic medication is a disorder called tardive dyskinesia, uh, where essentially a person's face muscles uh, stop working. Um, it's similar to aphasia, um, and it causes the drooping of their face, uh, which obviously can be uh, you know, somewhat of an issue. But of course, when we're talking about medication, it's all about looking at, uh, you know, do the pros outweighs the cons. With anti-anxiety medication, uh, we're looking at things like Xanax or Valium. And the problem with Xanax or Valium is that um, on their own, they're not super effective. Uh, however, uh, they can be more effective um, when uh, combined with psychotherapy. So com combining psychotherapeutic techniques with the slowing down of this anti-anxiety, these basically are, you know, extreme depressants. Um, these are barbiturates and they, uh, they basically look to really, um, to slow down an individual's fear and anxiety. Um, but the big problem with anti-anxiety often is that with anti-anxiety drugs, um, people will often get in kind of, kind of to a classical conditioning type relationship with them where every time they begin to feel that anxiety, it's oop, pop a pill, which of course can go down a slippery slope towards addiction. Antidepressant drugs, um, uh, there's a lot of them out there. Um, antidepressant drugs work as agonists. Um, basically, what they do is they keep uh, serotonin molecule uh, neurotransmitters in the synapse for longer, causing them to stimulate, overstimulate uh, a cell and causing more and more connections with them. Um, because antidepressant drugs work as SSRIs. SSRIs stand for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor, and so it blocks the reuptake process with serotonin, causing serotonin to stay in the synapse for longer and continually activate uh, the uh, neurotransmitters and receptor sites, causing an ultimate uh, improvement in mood. Finally, there's lithium carbonate. Lithium carbonate is a simple salt, um, but essentially what it does uh, is uh, is it levels the mood swings that are associated with bipolar disorder. Um, and certainly um, uh, it helps with people um, with bipolar disorder who might be at risk for suicide. Um, and um, certainly even sometimes can create uh, just very constant and level behavior. It slows people down and gentles them out um, and keeps, and in many cases, keeps them from ruining relationships. All right, and lastly, we look at biomedical techniques. Um, electro, electroconvulsive therapy is a really controversial technique um, because what it does is essentially send uh, volts of electricity into the brain to stimulate certain portions of the brain. Now, done over time, repeatedly over time, this can cause an individual uh, to lower have incredibly lowered depression uh and uh ect is actually a really really uh good um way to lower depression the literally the only side effect is that it uh causes some short-term memory loss uh now obviously this is a controversial technique because in movies and media this is shown as a form of torture um which it is not um a person is uh, given uh, uh, sedative so that they're asleep when this happens. Um, but ultimately, uh, although it seems barbaric, it's actually not. Uh, another one that's used is RTMS. And RTMS stands for Repetitive Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation. And essentially, it's similar to ECT, 
um, but instead of using electricity, it uses magnetism. Um, and it produces no memory loss or no serious side effects, um, though it's not as effective as ECT. Back in the day, they used to use psychosurgery, which is essentially cutting open the brain to uh, remove um, or uh, sever some of the connections between different structures within the brain. Um, the most common psychosurgery technique was prefrontal lobotomy, which essentially did a Phineas Gage type technique to a person's frontal lobe. Um, this obviously changed them as an individual, though sometimes that was important, uh, and though it made them um, obviously have uh, a lot of other accompanying issues. Uh, today, surgery is not performed very often. Um, and if it is performed, it's usually microsurgery, which is designed to specifically uh, treat uh, very small clusters within the brain rather than large structures. Finally, the last thing that can be done, and this is also a biomedical therapy, is lifestyle change. Um, sometimes a change in an individual's lifestyle may help them more than uh, they can even begin to explain. Um, and so therapeutic lifestyle change looks to uh, increase the amount of exercise, the amount of sleep, the amount of light and social connections that a person gets, along with focusing on anti-rumination. And rumination is that overthinking. So uh, different techniques for anti-rumination and along with nutritional supplements. This way uh, they get people get the correct vitamins, they get the correct types of exercise, the correct amount of sleep and light um, and social connections, which by doing that over time uh, can uh, lessen or improve uh, people's um, uh, mental illness that they might suffer from. And this is where we stop.